All right, we got Clarissa Chun. She's one of the goats of women's wrestling in U.S. wrestling history. Really, she is. I was looking. At, I was looking up your whole bio, and uh, it's crazy all the stuff that you've accomplished. To be honest, so um, we're just going to start at the beginning. Um, you grew up in Hawaii, so how did you get started wrestling in Hawaii as a kid? Um. So I started off as a kid doing judo. I grew up doing judo. That's, that's my combat background. Um, I went to a Buddhist elementary school. So quite naturally, there was like a, kind of like a YMCA, but it was called a YBA, um, similar like mission and whatnot. And started judo when I was seven and then got into wrestling when I was a junior in high school. And it's the same uh, time that wrestling was girls wrestling was sanctioned, a sanctioned sport in the late 90s. How was Hawaii? Sorry, sorry for interrupting you. How was Hawaii so I'm ahead sorry. of everybody else on uh, sanctioning girls wrestling? I don't know. I think, uh, you know, we're a small island, you know, um, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and there's a lot of pride in and as a state as far as um just sports in general so i think there's a lot of um people who support um females in sport plus to um there was a house of representative from hawaii patsy Mink. she helped write title nine you know and she helped and she's from hawaii so she helped push the movement of equality equal rights for women you know as far as participation in sports and whatnot so that, it could have been a combination of a lot of things. So, and, um, you know, there's a lot of heavy Asian influence culture in Hawaii. And um, that's how, why I grew up doing judo. And I think people are more accepting to, to looking at wrestling as kind of like a martial art, you know, combat sport, you know. So it was never divided as like, this is a men's sport, you know, like, so I was very fortunate to, have support from my family and my coaches and teammates you know I wasn't treated different because I was a female it was I was like one of the other wrestlers yeah Jesse you want to ask yeah so you're from Hawaii how do you get all the way from Hawaii to Missouri Valley oh yeah so lucky timing um that year that I graduated high school, Missouri Valley College was the first women's wrestling college scholarship program. And luckily coach Mike Mockoats had that vision to get that going and to make it a freestyle, like, um, cause he could have chose to go folk style, but I think he had this vision of, hey, let's bring these women in and give them opportunities at the higher level, right? International level. So. Uh, like our actual women's coach, the very first women's coach at Missouri Valley, he didn't know freestyle. So, and I didn't know freestyle. I didn't even know it existed. And, um, but we learned, we went to Sunkiss International Tournament. It was in October. It used to be, you know, they used to have a competition every year and we learned the rules, you know, by trial and error. And yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, so you kind of got in on, on this pretty early and now you're coaching at, at this level, at the, at the Olympic level. So, I mean, what are some of, obviously the whole game's changed, but what are some of the major things that stand out to you that have changed in women's wrestling just over the entire course of your experience with it? Um, opportunity, right? So um, as each state sanctioned girls wrestling, it gives more girls the opportunity to give it a try, right? Some, some people don't mind wrestling boys, but they don't have that opportunity to continue further, just depending on individuals, right? Whether their coaches do want them on their team or don't want them on the team, whatnot. So I think the biggest thing I see is growth for women's wrestling. It's like continuously growing and giving these women opportunities more. And there's like, when I uh, went to Missouri Valley, you know, in the early 2000s, late 90s, is just us, Minnesota Morris, maybe Cumberland's like 
literally could count on one hand how many college programs there were for women and now there's 80 over 80 college programs for women you know and so on top of that it I don't know the exact statistics but um someone had said that um in the early 2000s it went from like 800 girls wrestling to now we have like over 22,000 you know girls wrestling right now in in the high school age groups so um yeah uh and with with that comes the competition right the level of competition rises with with more more people more depth you know um so it's exciting times you know besides rules change throughout usually every quad for some reason but it's yeah it's exciting did you whenever you were getting started in the game more did you foresee this progress happening and if you did, did you see it happening either this slowly or this quickly? Which, which one do you consider the progress you've made with states sanctioning wrestling for girls? I think I'm a little bit surprised that um, not all 50 states are sanctioned yet. You know, like Hawaii sanctioned it in 97, 98 season. So that was... 22 years ago so I'm a little bit surprised that it's taking other states a little bit longer um and uh the I think the more most exciting part for me was um when in 2002 when they said that women's wrestling was going to be included into the Olympic Games because up until then I was you know got into wrestling I had a judo I could have gone the judo route and they had women's judo in the Olympics but I chose uh, wrestling because the opportunity to get a scholarship and continue at my education and wrestle. Um, and I think the most exciting was that decision to include women's wrestling in 2002 for the 2004 Olympics. Um, and I, and I, I think maybe I expected things would shoot faster once that had happened, you know, when, once they were like, women's wrestling is recognized as an Olympic sport. Like, and I, I just, I think I assumed everyone was going to jump on board. Right. And it, and they did slowly. I think slowly they did, you know, like um, we still, you know, I say we, as in women's wrestling, you know, we we were scrutinized and there were things that we had to make sure that we represented you know ourselves to the highest right like we didn't want to give any any person any reason of why we shouldn't be there you know if anything it's like we belong right and we're going to show you why like all these reasons why and these and and kind of yeah so yeah well that kind of leads perfectly to what i was going to ask you about next which is it's kind of hard to backtrack and go through all the world experiences you had but definitely a big standout one was whenever you got bronze in the 2012 Olympics, which kind of what you're talking about. I think that that for, for the American girls wrestling scene, that was a huge visibility marker, basically, you know, we have a, we have a, a woman placing at the Olympics and everything, which is still kind of crazy to think that's eight years ago and we're still, you know, working our way towards mm -hmm. visibility. But um, what a, I know this is a big question, but, kind of recap your your experience uh getting bronze at the olympics it's a unique experience obviously <laughs> yeah i'm sorry can you say recap my Re olympic experience yes re recap your, your 2012 you experience yeah sorry um, no yeah um ooh. uh it was ex it was it was i don't even know where to start um because I also went in 2008, you know, and I think they were so great in different ways, you know, and there was different leading up into like preparedness and whatnot, whether we like, so for in 2012, we had our acclimation camp in Northern France. So we weren't, we weren't in the heart of everything. We did the opening ceremonies, which was electrifying and all this energy and it's hard to go to bed after it because the energy right from everyone the athletes the spectators and whatnot all the volunteers and everything i can't even describe it fully as far as put into words how how energizing it was 
to go through the opening ceremonies, you know. Um, but so after the opening ceremonies, we um, trained in northern France just to get away from all the energy and distractions and whatnot. And because we were in the second week of, of the games. And so we spent a week in a quiet, remote, like country, rural, like area in France. And it was just our time to like, you know, just, just be, you know, with the team and refine, like really the work's been done, you know? So it's just staying ready and prepared, like staying ready, I guess, you know? And um, actually going through the competition, uh, it was, you know, normally I like sometimes if you think back on it and it's like the Olympics can be very, exciting or nerve-wracking right like it could be go one of two ways and I think for me it was just I was just so excited I was like here's my chance to like represent Team USA on the biggest stage and you know like my first round like I remember Terry Steiner you know the head coach of the national team was like hey you know I haven't wrestled this Chinese girl do you want to watch film on her you know and I never really watched film to study my opponents because I felt like that would like I I, I didn't work well that way you know but I did for some odd reason I spent like two two to two to five minutes max like just knowing her trick moves and came up with like a plan that morning you know of the competition and you know there's a lot of things through the competition that I, you know, wish I had made some adjustments to, but um, in the end, like for that bronze medal match, it was, you know, it was to avenge my loss against her in the 2008 Olympics. And it really was just like mental, you know, like telling myself that she wasn't going to get me and she wasn't going to like beat me up that I was going to, I was going to lose if I was going to not get this match is because I beat myself up first, you know? So, um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain just being in that moment and, um, just knowing what it felt walking away, like without that, like metal. And I know like in the end, honestly, the metal is great. You know, it's, I think it's just the pursuit of, you know, putting my best out there, you know, and in 2000, 2008 I would have told you I was I was like before the Olympics I would have told you I was going to be done competing but it wasn't until my semi-final match losing in the Olympics where I felt like I wasn't done because the worst feeling is knowing you had a little bit more in you and you didn't put it all out there so yeah yeah Sorry, that you, was su you, you summed <laughs> that up well by the way that was good um so now you're coaching so and you've had this Olympic experience so explain how difficult it is as a coach to maybe prepare your athletes by in a situation where we're adding a whole nother year to the Olympic cycle, right? How do you make those adjustments as a coach uh, yeah. with, with so, that in mind? Ooh. Yeah. Um, you know, like really, you know, I've never been through that situation. So the, the, cause a lot of things I share with the athletes is like, you know, my own personal experiences and whatnot. But the only thing that I do, like that we do tell our, I mean, a lot of the things that we do tell our athletes is, you know, everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's in the same position in the sense that, you know, the whole world has took a pause because of what's going on. And, you know, and they understand that this is, it's being postponed for the right reasons, you know, for the health and safety of everyone, you know, in the world. And um, it's like, what, like, just let's do this the best we can, right? During these times, let's be our best in these times, you know, and take care of the things that we can control. So whether it's keeping a routine, you know, keeping your nutrition in check and your strength and conditioning, you know, uh, you know, and working on the, the things that you can control, the things that are available to you. You know, some people are fortunate to have a resting mat in their garage or their basement. Some people are not, you know, so it's like, how do we adjust? How do we, um, 
you know, like make the most and best during these times, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of things that they can work on, whether it's sports psychology, different readings, visualizations. Um, there's so many things like video watching, you know, um, and yeah, so in these times, it's, it, it makes, you know, not only the athletes have to be creative, but even for me as a coach, get creative too, you know, like, you know, um, that's why I, you know, like getting your, your text, I was like, oh man, well, this is a great, 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 what you guys are doing for your athletes. You know, these are, these are the things, this is what it's about, right? Like finding ways to keep the athletes engaged and motivated and inspired. And yeah, so. Sorry, I was muted. Um, this is kind of a question I was thinking of, but girls wrestling, the growth is like exponential right now because it's just advancing really quickly. Is there a, is there a possibility that in a year there's going to be a girl who no one even like knows about right now who could propel herself to being on that level of competing for an Olympic spot? Uh, I feel like wrestling's a little hard, like, quite could possibly right i mean like it was saying bolt i feel like he's one of those guys that they just picked out of somewhere in jamaica and he was just like boom right but you know wrestling there's there's a lot of technical skill and like tactical like knowledge to know and understand so i think in that case it'd be hard but there's no doubt there are people out there with amazing athletic abilities you know so yeah on you know, blast but there's been some changing in the landscape of of uh senior level women's wrestling just in the last 24 hours which kind of just magnifies how difficult is it for women's wrestlers to find a training situation that that is ideal for them for... sorry did I, did I freeze up there uh, no. yeah um you're talking about senior level athletes Yes. as far as your changes and adjustments yeah you know everyone is different as far as you know it could go same for the men's program right like it, there's been shifting and moving and whatnot you know and um and I can say like my journey has taken me different places too so you know I had a few years at Missouri Valley went to the Olympic Training Center and then I stayed in Colorado and I had like another coach outside of the training center that I trained with. I moved back and went to Mizzou and trained with Sammy Henson, Coach Henson and West Virginia. So like I can understand like um, certain shifts and moves and whatnot. Um, and I think it just depends on the, each individual as far as like where they feel they fit best. And it's not like um, whether or not the coach, you know, necessarily if the coach is for them or not, it's more, also, like, at least in the woman's side, I think sometimes it could be that or it could be, it's such a unique um, dynamic, right, going into wrestling as far as, because it is an individual sport. And um, uh, I would say, like, non-Olympic years, there's 10 weight classes. And then going from 10 to 6, you know, and um, sometimes people don't want to be in the same room as someone in their weight class, you know, some you know, um, for me, when I first started, it, it was, you know, I, I was in the room with Patricia Miranda, Stephanie Murata, you know, like all these world medalists at the weight class that I was trying to fight for, you know, and for me, it was a little different. I didn't have anything to protect. I was, I was trying to gun for them. They're the ones that I had to try to beat, you know, so if anything, it, I felt like it benefited me by being around my competitors, you know. Um, and I think it just depends on each individual on how they approach, like how they want to prepare themselves to be their best, you know, and who, who they feel can help get them there. Right. Because it is an individual sport, you know, to some extent, to a lot of extent. So. Like is the opportunity what it should be oh. for women? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not there yet. Like, I don't think it's there yet. I think, um, I think 
uh, RTCs, if you're speaking like as far as RTCs, I think they're trying, you know, like I know Coleman Scott has had a few athletes at North Carolina and you're talking Hawkeye Wrestling Club in Iowa um, and then like Arizona State, you know, like I think, I think um, college programs are trying to get it going, you know, and are trying to support it, you know, in the right direction. I think, um, I think slowly we'll eventually get back to hopefully like growing that again. Like right now it's, it seems like I think Arizona State has the women now, right? But um, I hope, I mean, I hope not. I hope like, uh, uh, like Hawkeye Wrestling Club is, op- you know, like Tom has said, he's open for the women to stay, you know, and I hope um, that invitation stays open for any, any future females that are looking to want to train there. And I think that's, that's the goal, right. For, for women's wrestling in USA, right. Is like um, with the growth of the sport, more opportunities, and hopefully we can have like uh, all these regional training centers for, for women, you know, uh, cause right now it's, it's college programs. And after you're done with the college programs is OTC. And then, and I think that's what people are trying to look for, you know, is like, where do I fit, you know? Um, and with which program do I fit with? Right. So um, quite naturally the Olympic training center is like the route or WCAP is the route after college because it's been there. It's in place. Um, there is a staff 24, you know what I mean? There is a staff in place for those programs at the training center or WCAP, but you know, until everything is solidified in each regional training center, then it's hard to say, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I know Coach Sammy Henson, you know, he, when he went out to West Virginia, he started the Mountaineer Regional Training Center and, you know, like, Technically, you know, I wrestled under Sunkiss slash Mountaineer Re- Regional Training Center. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Do you, uh, you try to get, how do you pitch it for girls to, or any, any athlete? Do you try to pitch for people to come out to the OTC or at, and live? Or would you say that's more of like a situational opportunity for them? Yeah, I think situational. Like I said, everyone, everyone's, different it's no different than picking what college do you want to go to and why you know like it's like okay where do you want to like why okay why would you want to train in Arizona or why would you want to train in Colorado or what what drives you to go out to West Virginia you know to train out there you know and it's usually you know because the coaching but also another piece of it is like you got to think about your training partners because I know for me you know I had to recruit, like, luckily when I was training with Coach Henson, like, his his sons, like, Jackson and Wyatt Henson were, you know, like, Jackson was my size, and he outgrew me, but Wyatt grew up, grew into my weight class, and that was, like, the biggest thing for me is I always had to continually recruit people because I was in a smaller weight class, like, 105, 48 kilos. Um, I constantly had to recruit people because – these kids would just outgrow me and, you know, after a few years. And um, so I think uh, the having the right coach is good, but also having the training partners. And that's, that's something that training center has to offer. They do have the training partners, you know, they have almost 20 people that live in Colorado Springs and train out there. So, I mean, uh, it's, 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 you know, it depends what each individual athlete is looking for. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll let you go here in a second. Um, Jesse, you want to, you want to ask her one of our, we kind of ask everyone the same final question. It might take you a second to think about, but. <laughs> so we just always ask everybody if they have a wrestling story that really sticks out to them from their time. It could be funny, weird, goofy, or just really good. But if you got one that really sticks out to you. you you've traveled a lot of places, so you might have something unique. <laughs> okay, say it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, oh, okay. uh, so we just always ask everybody if they have a wrestling story, like a unique wrestling story that sticks out to them. Could be funny, weird, 
or just really good in general. So yeah, a unique wrestling story, non-Olympic related for me would probably be going to Krasnyarsk, Russia. Um, just if anyone knows, you know, like January, negative 40 degrees. And, you know, just like the Russian culture, right? Uh, I, coach Sergei Belaglazov was like the men's resident coach at the time. And, um, you know, he's like a superstar in Russia. And we were in Russia and he took us to a special sauna and meaning it felt like mafia. You know, you're, <laughs> we're going down to the basement, going through uh, a kitchen of some sort. Everything's like, like cherry wood lavish and tiles and I uh, he was leading a whole group of us it was like me Iris Smith who's the world champion Marcy Van Dusen who's uh Olympian as well uh Sally Roberts she's a world medalist uh there's a bunch of us girls he walked us down to this mafia looking sauna and we were like what is like we weren't we weren't so sure but um we just that's like a little taste of Russia for us and um I don't know it's a great story but it was uh, that's good. I can't that's think good. Of it that's good that's good I like it, I like we, it. We, like, we like to get diverse array of experiences so that's good thank you Clarissa thank you very much. for being with us and for taking the time to talk to us yeah.